Hey friends, welcome to The Living Room. You're in the right place and today's conversation will be inspiring to you. Do me a favor, press that subscribe button, the notification bell and like this video and share it with your family and friends so that this message can continue to inspire others. I'm glad you're here. Make yourself right at home and enjoy. Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Glad you're here. Make yourself right at home. What is courage? Is it the absence of fear, or is it the presence of faith? Perhaps it's a bit of both. I've come to learn that courage is definitely a requirement for leadership, but beyond that, it takes courage just to live well. And our special guest knows a thing or two about living courageously. No, not because he has not dealt with his fair share of fears, but because despite them, he continues to cultivate a life of faith at home, at work, and in the everyday marketplaces of life. And here to help us learn the lessons he has received along the way is my brother and friend, BC and Wade. What's going on, my brother? What's happening, family? How you doing, man? <laughs> man, it's good to see you. Glad to have you hanging out with us. Good to be here. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, how long have we known each other? <sighs> Lord, I don't know. <laughs> Rich, so I know it's on like the upside of like 10 or 12 years, something like that. Easy. If, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's been a while. We, we are officially old. We're old people. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, I know that because when we go back to uh, Oakwood or when we go back to places where we've worked together, and people ask us, when did you graduate? And once you start getting like the, ooh, yeah, you know, yeah. those faces and those responses, that's when you know yeah. you're not as young as you used to be. You can't yeah. say, oh, I graduated last year. They're like, man, you weren't even there with my older sibling because they were there after yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 that's old. <laughs> when you consider it's been about a decade since we left uh, undergrad. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's been a while. We are officially... Um, I wouldn't say senior statesman, but we uh, <laughs> we get We're in there. Climbing. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're climbing. In fact, I just came across some photos. I was digging through my jump drive, um, and I came across some photos of our graduation weekend. Mm. Uh, me, you, Jason, Philip, yeah, um, and several yeah. others, and it feels it feels like yesterday. yesterday. Like in my mind, yeah. I know yeah. that it wasn't yesterday, but in terms of the feelings that come with those memories, yeah, I mean. You couldn't tell me it wasn't last week when we were marching down the aisle at the church or in the it was, Lombron Center. It was last week. I remember you standing up on my right hand yeah. <laughs> as Lola Moore Johnson was was bringing this word. I remember you standing Literally. up and crossing. I remember this. It was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking about those stones crossing the Jordan River. Um, but that. obviously, there's enough. There are enough memories and life moments that have transpired since 2012 for us to know with certainty that it wasn't yesterday. Yeah. Um, a yeah. lot has happened. But let's go back a few yesterdays. Let's and I just want to ask you, man, when did you discern this call to ministry? So I want to say I was 14. And it, uh, it, it came on me really, really heavy in a really like, I cannot ignore this, though I want to way. Um, we so I'm, I'm from I'm from New York, Queens in the building. And um, <laughs> but uh, a large portion of my family is from New Jersey, specifically Orange, uh, uh, East and West Orange. And so um, we would frequently go to the Church of the Oranges um, there in New Jersey to, to fellowship, have, spend time, eat food. One particular Sabbath morning, I was feeling really, really weird. And um, we got in the car. And I just could not place my feeling. What am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? I don't know. And uh, I, I don't know if um, I'm going to date myself, but we grew up listening Special Sabbaths to Family Radio, Oakland, yeah. California, nine four six two one. And um, I know it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the way down, um, they're playing all these songs by a group named Commissioned. Uh, yeah. The stories they're telling are about uh, uh, Noah answering God's call, Jonah mm. answering God's call. This is really weird to me. So we get down to Church of the Oranges. Uh, Pastor Trusty was still there. 
And yeah. the sermon on that day was about discerning God's call on your life and answering God's call. Wow. So it was really weird feelings came back uh, on the ride, the whole way home, the same kind of thing. And so uh, when I grew up, I went to the Linden, the Linden Seventh Adventist church in uh, Queens, New York, the Eastern conference. And so uh, Linden at that time had this, this habit, they um, partnered young kids with uh, older uh, teens, they called it like God guidances. And so my God guidance was Dillis Brooks. And, um, Whoa, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I called her, um, when we had gotten home and she wasn't at home, this was the day before cell phones. So I mm -hmm. left a, a voicemail on her answer machine and, or a message on her answer machine. And, um, the message was just, Hey, how do you know when God is calling you to do something? Hung up the yeah. phone, kept it moving. And, um, I was hanging outside of the church after AY, uh, ready for the sun go down uh, so that we can go to the gym, start playing ball and so forth. And Dillis's little red car comes screeching up to the church. And she hops out and she is like a lunatic. Yeah. Uh, she's yelling, what did you say on my answer machine? What did you say? And so I'm just like, I, I, I just asked, how do you know when God is calling you to do something? And she goes, yes, that's how you know. <laughs> Went That's down this Dillis. whole long cascade about how they had actually just been talking about me wow. um, prior to her hearing the message and saying, man, I feel like BC has a call on him and so forth. And she gets home. Here's the message. So now she's in full on mentor mode. Man, you, you got to pray about this thing. You got to go to Oakwood. You got to answer the call. You gotta, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. And me, a 14 year old kid, Queens, New York. Uh, Rich, you know me. I, I'm, I wasn't trying to be anybody's pastor. I wasn't trying to yeah. be a lawyer. <laughs> I wanted to be a uh, an r and singer. I wanted to be a track and field superstar. Sure. And um, so I ran, I ran promptly and I have a whole running story um, mm -hmm. before God kind of like really tapped me on the shoulder and said, look fam, you can do what you want to do, but you're not going to have peace. And um, yeah. then I began my, my slow walk with him. How do we make this thing happen? But 14 years old was probably when I, I received that, I guess, without a doubt, God is calling me. There had been signs and hints prior to that you know conversation strangers approaching you um on the road but that was like the definitive all right this is it so i definitely didn't know that for you you had early sensibilities to this call to ministry as early as 14 when we met uh in the 2000 before 2010s it was in the early 2000s you know around 2007 ish early aughts um, i think i i i i think i learned that you had served in the military yes is that right yes and so i don't want to assume but i'll ask the question was that a part of your running experience it, it kind of was um okay. i lost a dear friend uh in 9 11 I, I called her mm. my cousin um mm. loved her to death i was a really angry kid um and I, I i wanted to do something and then on top of that wow. i loved like on the back side of it now watching god's fingerprints in and seeing him um, my, um, my plan was to go to Temple University, had a track scholarship at the Temple. Sure. And, um, are you serious? Oh yeah. Yeah. Full ride. Temple. <laughs> Rich, I'm quick. I'm quick. Um, what, what, what were your events? Uh, what was your event? Four by one, uh, the okay. 100, the 110, 400 high hurdles, the 100, 110 high hurdles, long jump and high jump. I, I'm quick. <laughs> I'm quick. I had no idea. I really oh, didn't Rich. know that. I'm quick. My uh, my PR in the high jump is like six two. Um, wow. I'm I'm quick, law. Uh, um, Rich, I'm quick. Um, but um, so um, I put all my eggs in that basket, right? I'm going to Temple. I'm going to Olympics. I'm going to be a lawyer. That's it. So I didn't apply to any other schools, and um, I was because of my ability in high school. I could kind of like um. You know, most of our meets are on Saturdays, but my school was like, no, this kid needs to run. So they mm -hmm. would maneuver things so that I could run before the sun went down on Fridays and shift my heats or, um, you know, uh, after the sun goes down on Saturdays, um, you know, we'd move whole, whole days, you know, we'd change, yeah. you know, and the big, the first big hurdle for me was um, uh, state champs, uh, qualify yeah. for states, states was on Sabbath. And, you know, my school's like, hey, just be honest, we can't move this. Uh, can you run? And I told them, no, it's the Sabbath. You know, I was still a young kid. I didn't really 
know what I know now, right? right. Uh, it was more so rote, um, sure. you know, than, than a belief in Jesus Christ. And I was like, no, it's the Sabbath, I don't run and so forth. And so it was a whole big, you know, big deal. Kid turns down states, you know, for the Sabbath. And so, right. um, but I, I continued in my, in my career and uh, applied, Temple got, you know, got through. And so in my interview with them, went down with my coach and everything, um, they're talking through and they're like, yeah, so, you know, here's, you know, here's our schedule. I looked at it really casually. I'm like, oh yeah, I don't run on Saturdays, but you know, we can make that happen. And they're like, oh no, no, you, you will run on Saturdays. Yeah. And so I said, no, I, I've never run on Saturdays. My school makes the shifts and so forth. And I said, well, listen, you don't run, you know, no scholarship. And so um, I did not go to Temple. And, um, you know, that compiled on, you know, my, just my angst and anger with, um, you know, 9-11, my, my uncertainty of the state of the world and so forth. Um, long story short, I went to the Marine Corps, loved it to death. I would have stayed a full 20 years, but even wow. there seeing God's fingerprints, uh, where he's like, no, I'm, I'm going to let you go this long way and I'll bring you back so you can realize, man, this is just me. And so I met Christ while I was in the Marine Corps. Um, wow. And then I got injured and I had to um, I had to uh, separate from the Marine Corps. So I was honorably discharged. My unit did a really great job of hiding me from paperwork. And so whole long story, but um, when I was sitting at rock bottom, mm. came back and was like, what are we doing? And mm. uh, that uh, <laughs> that's a whole other long story as well. But that, that culminated in me um, sending an application to Oakwood, packing a bag without an uh, acceptance, heading down to Huntsville without knowing where I was going to be, who I was going to stay with, anything. And, you know, here we are. I appreciate you sharing that you were angry um, in part because of what had happened to your cousin or at least cousin figure. Mm -hmm. And this thought came to mind as you shared. Um, I knew that you were from New York, but I didn't, I never really translated that back to, oh, BC was probably one of my friends from New York who was very much aware of where they were mm -hmm. on 9-11. I'm from Tampa, Florida, and I know where I was, and that's miles away. How much more than if you grew up in New yeah. York yeah. and how just being by way of proximity, being so close to the, to the tragedy, being so close and the trauma that comes by way of location, right? Yeah. Like if you're in New York and you have family in, excuse me, if you're in California and you have family in New York during 9-11, you can still be traumatized. You can be a Californian, not know anyone and still be traumatized. But if you're in New York, yeah. it's like, I, I always tell people, like, where were you? And I tell them where I was. Mm -hmm. But I also say the year before 9-11, I was in New York. We went to visit family. Mm -hmm. And I remember my parents pointing out the Twin Towers to me. So yeah. when 9-11 happened, they said, do you remember those two tall buildings that looked exactly like? I said, yeah, those fell down. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, right? And just that simple Family vacation created a reference point that was like, this is crazy. Again, for someone who's from there, yeah. the kind of anger, the kind of mixed emotion. Yeah. Now add to it. I know someone um, that's very real anger. Mm -hmm. That's very real. And, and we're young. Yeah. You know, we are we are teenagers. Yeah. Um, like you said, we don't necessarily have all that much life experience to be able to process this with some other components. I mean, this thing is raw. This is yep. real. Yep. Um, the reason I draw a circle around that is because without that, a person could take what you shared before that, you know, I kind of had a running experience and just say, oh, you know, you weren't trying to listen to God without being willing to say, but God and I had a lot to negotiate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I had information yeah. about God, but then there's also my experience. Yes. And, yes. and yes, I'm willing to admit that that I had an assortment of emotions coming on the inside. Let me ask you, when it comes to being in touch with your emotions, even mm -hmm. like you said, one morning, 14 years old, I didn't know what I was feeling. You know, have you cultivated that over the years just personally? Would you say my parents were instrumental or other persons have been instrumental in helping me to have an awareness of how my emotions play a part with, you know, how I live life? Man, we, we receive gifts from God that we sometimes don't equate as gifts. We don't, we don't consider them gifts. Yeah. Yeah. And, talk um, about that. I have, as long as I can remember, been really, really in tune with my emotions. Mm. Even if mm. I can't describe what I'm feeling. Yeah. Come in, on. In verbiage, 
yeah. I can use pictures to describe what I'm feeling. The case in point, um, uh, it's one of the things, and I know we'll talk about it later, one of the things I struggle with is depression. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting in a room with one of my counselors and saying to them, there's a dark room in my head. In the middle of that dark room is a dilapidated and worn door, barely on its hinges. Mm. There's a miasma seeping through the cracks of that door. And I am in that room struggling with all of my might to keep that door closed. Wow. Because there's something on the other side of it. I don't know what it is, but I know that if the door opens, it will kill me. And I'm just, it fills me with dread. Yeah. I remember we went through our program and so far I was talking through and he's like, man, how are you feeling? I said, like, man, that room I told you about, it's bright. It's a bright room and the door is still there. There's still something on this side of it, but the door is like, it's a new door. It's reinforced. Uh, there's some, you know, uh, paneling and, and, and there's lights on it. And I remember him saying, man, you describe your emotions and your feelings really, really well. Hmm. And I, I can't say until recently that it's something that I have been intentional about cultivating, but it's something I've always had. I've never considered it a sure. gift. And sure. I call it a gift because one, I am able to articulate very clearly how I'm feeling at any given moment, but yeah. I'm also able to kind of come alongside people and help mm-hmm. them experience and unpack what they're feeling and what they're going through. Um, but, but as long as I can remember, I've been just that kid who's like, oh, I feel... I felt really close to Molly music because Molly sometimes will say, mm. oh, this feels red, or this feels blue. <laughs> and I get that. I'm like, oh, this feels, this feels green. You know, uh, I lead praise and worship. I talk to people and I say, uh, here's how I want you to sing it. And I'll tell them a story about a, a breeze blowing over a hill and or lights in a forest. And it's really yeah. weird, but they'll sing it and then it'll feel like that. Yeah. So now I'm cultivating it intentionally. I'm trying to, you know, be... Uh, direct about finding words and feelings and letting people know, hey, this is what I'm feeling. I'm trying to convey to you what I'm feeling. Uh, but it's something I've always, I've always had. Uh, yeah, both a gift and a curse. <laughs> <laughs> you were, you were one of the first peers that I recall during our time at Oakwood, who was courageous enough to be very open and transparent about um, journey. And I, I'm learning to be more selective with my language because I think we can easily say things like struggle with. And for mm-hmm. some people, it's not a struggle because of what that might image or depict. Sure. It's just a journey. And you were one of the first ones who I can recall um, and others like Jason O'Rourke, yeah. um, you know, who were kind of at the forefront, not of some movement. You know, It wasn't like, hey, we're about to champion some trend. <laughs> it's like, no, this is just me being me even as much as I'm trying to learn what that really means. Mm -hmm. And at this point in my life, I know that that means I experience, you know, anxiety or depression, or, you know, there's some things to take like a Jason or others that I could name, you know, and say in my past and, and it's causing my present to be an uphill kind of climb, even as I am stepping towards my future. And I remember that like, man, people often think of courage or this image of having it to, as an image of having it together or like, you know, nothing, nothing can shake me. You know, I'm all the way up, that kind of thing. You know what I mean? But I was able to have a different definition of courage as I related to many of my peers, as they were saying, you know what? Today's not a good day. In mm-hmm. fact, I remember this. I don't exactly remember like what day it was, but it was in Mosley. We were in one of our classrooms at BC, man, what's up? How you doing? He was just like, Rich, I'm not doing well today. And I was like, wow, like, did he just say that? You know what I mean? Because of course, what's most natural is how you doing, man, I'm good, doing you know, great. move on. Yeah. He was like, I'm not doing well today. But it wasn't like a catch me, I'm about to fall. It was like, we're getting through it. You know, yeah. I'm here, yeah. it's time for class. But if you ask me, I'm, I'm willing enough, courageous enough to be honest to say, you know, this day is not a good day. Mm-hmm. And since we finished Oakwood, since we finished seminary and into our careers and family lives, you know, there is a difference between the pastoral ministry we studied in class and, and in what we deal with in life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just like waves, stress comes, man, how have you learned? And maybe even what practices do you employ as coping mechanisms and as self-care? Man, uh, that's a that's a really, really 
beautiful question. Um, so I, I refer to depression when I speak about my relationship with it. Okay. I refer to it as my wrestle with it. Okay. Okay. Because I hate the notion of saying I have depression. Mm. Right. Okay. Sure. Um, I, 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 I don't take ownership of it. It is something that I am in relationship with. Yeah. And that mindset has allowed me to treat it like I would a relationship. Mm. So wow. in the same way that I do in the relationship between you and I, my members and myself, my family and myself, there's some preparation um, that needs to be considered with regard to my relationship with depression. And so because I have uh, been clinically diagnosed with depression, I know that there's a, a deficit within, uh, uh, um, within my brain system where there's mm. not, a, 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 there's not a, enough production of a certain chemical. Okay. Um, it's not something that I can say, oh yeah, this thing happened and I'm feeling sad. Yeah. It's just, and it's a great day. Uh, I'm feeling sad. I can't feel the sun. Mm -hmm. And so uh, because of that, it's cyclical, it's sporadic, mm -hmm. but it's also uh, projectable in some regard. Okay. So I've learned to prepare uh, on the mountaintops from my trips through the valley. Wow. 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 Okay. So there are periods mm -hmm. where I'm doing great. Um, uh, medication is helping. The weather is wonderful. My relationship with my family is top notch. And mm -hmm. uh, those endorphins are really, really high. I'm in a good space mentally, physically, emotionally. Yeah. In those times, uh, Solomon would say, consider the ant. Right? Mm. And mm. so in those moments, I'm really intentional about being in the gym. Yeah. I'm really intentional about uh, where, where you would do long distances. Uh, I'm really intentional about, about running my sprints, right? Sure. Um, I'm really intentional about cultivating my relationships, calling my friends, um, taking days to just walk in the park because I want to build up a storehouse so that when my cycle begins, I, I, I am not able to go as deep as I could go for as long as I could go. So mm. it's almost as if, um, if you consider depression a free fall emotionally, mm. Mm. it's almost as if I've given myself much more room to fall so that I don't hit the ground. Yeah. So as I come out of that, I'm able to uh, climb higher again and then prepare myself. So, so, so now what, what I find is that my lows aren't as low or as long and my mm -hmm. highs are higher uh, and much longer. Wow. Uh, so I'm just being intentional about making sure I am doing the work of preparing for those. Yeah. I'm not always successful. Um, and sometimes, a lot of times, my preparation cannot meet the weight of this particular sure. bout that I'm going to deal with. But this preparation that I'm doing uh, has kept me um, a long ways um, so that I'm not hitting rock bottom as I have done in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps us to have a different picture. First of all, the concept of a relationship. But then second of all, that it doesn't always have to be this spontaneous relationship, like mm -hmm. the unwelcomed visitor that just not only comes to your house, but doesn't knock doesn't even give you the courtesy of coming through the front door. I mean, just barges down the back door, climbs through the window mm. and all was well until it wasn't. But what you've helped us is to say, sometimes there's a relationship that you might not have asked for, solicited, or wasn't always occasioned by some event, right? That it could be physiological in nature. But then beyond that, even that doesn't mean that the presence of this relationship means that I can't redeem some level of control or some level of interaction with it, with it. And what you've shared with us is powerful mm -hmm. that I wanna prepare as much as possible mm -hmm. in advance. Um, 
And Which, I think that, no, go ahead, go ahead. If I can, there's another part to it that you just reminded me of in that with depression for a lot of people, right? It's not occasioned by anything. It, yeah. th there's no external catalyst for it, right? But that doesn't mean that external stimuli can't affect it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I can already be in, in my depression and then something happened and mm. I feel worse now than, you know, I did just with my depression, you know? And so that's why I'm remembering I'm so intentional about voicing how I'm feeling, about being yeah. in touch. So when you said, hey, BC, how you doing? I'm not doing well today, Rich. Mm -hmm. now, I find the benefit in that is if perchance I should snap at you. Yeah. Or you say, hey, BC, we're all going to Buffalo Wild Wings. You want to come? And I say, nah, I'm good. You know, my friend Richard doesn't feel like, oh, BC's blowing me off or he's being rude to me. Rather, he can, based on the information he has, BC's not having a great day. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have a negative impact on you, which doesn't have a negative impact on our relationship. Come on. which doesn't also have a negative impact on the already negative wrestling I'm doing with my depression. Yeah, And so it, you reminded me of exactly why I'm so vocal about, Hey, I struggle with this. I, um, my wife and I were talking the other day and, um, she was working and I had our daughter the entire day and I noticed I was being so short with her and, um, that it was hurting my heart. And she's like, daddy, daddy. And I'm like, Argh. and so, I spoke to my wife and said, hey, Jasmine, I'm having a pain in my hip uh, yeah. with my old uh, Marine Corps injuries. Um, I said, it, it's really it's really bothering me. And I'm noticing that I'm I'm being short with Jean. Would you mind taking her for a moment exclusively and just let me clear my space, right? And I find that being intentional about voicing exactly how I'm feeling to the mm. best of my ability keeps me from creating situations that yeah. make my wrestle with depression worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that my counselor deals with me on or his approach, his approach is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the concept of naming your emotions, framing them and then taming them, mm -hmm. you know, putting them in perspective so that they aren't, like you said, seeping over into areas of relationship where it's like my daughter, in your example, is not my pain. Mm -hmm. it's this, but mm -hmm. this can very much impact this. And I'm noticing it and I want to tame it. How do I tame it? Yeah. Hey, babe, can you partner with me while I go and kind of just work some things out? Mm -hmm. And um, you've given us permission really to feel. You've given us permission to know that our feelings can be connected to some things that we might not be able to control, but we can develop and learn and practice. And like you said, you I don't always get it right. You know, you may not always get it right, the viewer, the listener, um, but to cultivate um, an awareness and to cultivate um, some habits and some norms so that, you know, our true North is always trying to attend to relationship preservation. Sure. And um, I think that that's major. Uh, again, just another brief example before I transition. Uh, <laughs> I, I was sitting in the pews during one of a week of prayer that you gave and um, you began the message and it was a group of young people, young high school students um, at a boarding academy. And you said, um, you know what? I don't even feel like preaching right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, mm -hmm. which our homiletics teacher would frown upon in terms of like <laughs> things you never say <laughs> when you stand up to preach. Like, don't tell the people you don't feel like preaching, right? Uh -huh. um, but, but that being said, I think context also matters. Yes. And whereas maybe in an environment where there might have been more erudite, auspicious people, they might have been turned off. The students kind of sat up and said, wow, mm -hmm. I don't feel like being here either. Yeah. What do you have to say? Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And, and, but not that you were doing it as a, as a, as a rhetorical device. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But just the comfort level of kind of saying, for the sake of this this relationship as communicator yes. and as listeners. Yes. If I don't admit this, this could actually get in the way and you not know it. Yep. So I might say some things and say them in a way and this age group might be like, whoa, like what's mm -hmm. up with him? Mm -hmm. But the moment I kind of allowed you to come into me by saying, I got a lot going on and this moment, 
Mm -hmm. If it didn't happen, I wouldn't be upset. Yeah. Allow them to know like, whoa, he's willing to connect with us like that, right? Yeah. Um, and so in terms of connection and relationship development, when it comes to just period, first of all, it's not the easiest thing. Sure. But when you have an awareness that, okay, this is who I am, or, or, or excuse me, this is a relationship that I have. And these are some things that I want you to be mindful of. As you were cultivating your relationship with your wife, your now wife, mm -hmm. um, of course, I've had the benefit and the privilege of being with you all in friendship during dating, during courting, during engagement, and now subsequently marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've always loved how she, and this is why I believe God says, help me, right? Like mm -hmm. God knows who we need. And vice versa, right? Because that takes in consideration all that will come with being in relationship with me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think you and I have have grown in our journey to become self-aware enough to know it just couldn't have been anybody. No. You know what I mean? No. So what I want to ask is on the side of being a man, being a male, and I don't want to generalize too much, but sure. sometimes sure. when it comes to our weak areas or what might be prefaced as weak. Um, or areas where it's just like, this is what it is. And it, I wish it were different, but it's not, you know, did you struggle with allowing jazz in to kind of get close? And then ultimately, how did you all both develop a comfort or a system enough that said, this is a presence in my life, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have to be something that weakens our relationship. And then I guess the A part of that question would be, what do you all do to, to continue to manage that and facilitate that? Because I think that there might be those listening and watching who know what yep. that's like. And they're like, man, dating is difficult because I don't know how to manage that. Yeah. Or man, my marriage is going through because, you know, so share with that. And, and you sure. can go whichever way you want to go with that. So I, I think a good, a good anchor point for this portion of the conversation is um, my own feeling prior right. to even Jasmine. Uh, mm. because I'm so emotionally in tune with myself, I did not always feel like the man, right? Okay. Um, sure. In, in that uh, you, I mean, you went to school with me, you know, you went to school with me twice. And so, you know, um, you, you, you get the right, the right song going, right chord yeah. progressions. Yeah. I'm sitting in that sanctuary, weeping my entire face <laughs> out. Um, I know how things press me, how things prick me. And so I often did not feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the masculine one in the relationship. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it first, uh, it, our kind of dynamic first stemmed from my realization that she, she saw me. Mm. right not um my inclinations of who i was supposed to be not what i thought i should be any of that she saw the person that i was yeah and then i i had to become comfortable with fully being that person in her presence Ooh. yeah come so on i remember um which was his junior year or 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 sophomore year um, we were planning, I was planning with a few other people, African day for Madison mission. Yeah. Um, okay. Speaker for African day dropped out, I want to say the week of, mm -hmm. and we're sitting in, in, um, Dr. Doggett's office and, uh, we're like, who are we going to find? Who are we going to find? Who are we going to find? And that's a joke. Lawrence Safran, uh, says, BZ can do it. Yep. And doc looks at me and he goes, yep, you got it. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost my mind I remember. and most people don't know it. Most folk don't know it. It took everything to get me on that pulpit that Sabbath. I remember that. <laughs> but if you are careful to notice, I vanished for three months after that. Wow. I lived mm. in my room, in my bed mm. for three months. Uh, Philip Cameron would push food under my door. Mm. to make sure I was eating. And um, I remember in that space, Jasmine would come to visit. Yeah, I wasn't talking to anybody. The, the blinds were drawn in my room. I'm sure I smelled horribly. 
Jasmine would come and she would sit at my desk and she'd do her work. Wow. And then she'd finish and she'd leave. She'd mm. Come in, she'd sit there and she's, you know, pat my head. And then she'd leave. And it was this, okay, she cares enough about me. Yeah. That my mess is understood to not be me. Mercy, mercy. And mm. so she is comfortable enough to allow me to experience what I need to experience so long as it's not detrimental to me. Sure. And she's comfortable enough to be able to call me on my bull mm -hmm. and say, I know you don't want to go to the gym, but if you don't go to the gym, you're going to die. Mm. And nice. that kind of vulnerability, honesty um, has really folded over into our relationship. Yeah. Um, I'm able to say to her, hey, I'm not feeling this way today. Mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember I told you the first person I told when I started taking medication, I was like, when it kicked in, I woke up and I started crying. I said to her, I said, I, I feel the sun. Like I, I've never felt like this before. I felt like, oh, I don't have to die today. And, and I, I was able to let her know that. And she was able to respond in that and say, I'm glad you're feeling great. Yes. What are we doing next? What's the next step? And so I don't know if I'm answering the question, but you are. She, she has, what I would say to those who are in relationship, looking to get in relationship, I think the first thing to understand is, which is why I say I don't have depression, right? If I could be really, really corny and borrow from India Irie, I'm not my hair, right? Yeah. Um, uh, this is something that I wrestle with, I struggle with, I, I, I do whatever, whatever it is, right? Um, but this doesn't have to speak to who I am. And sure. I can allow for me to be seen, to be one of my most powerful phrases. I love it. It sits in my heart to know and be known. Yes, sir. Is yes, my sir. heart's desire. Mm -hmm. And so I'm able to allow myself to be known. Yeah. And I'm able to know. And, and that comes with the vulnerability, the transparency, the authenticity to say, so this this happens. This is who yeah. I am. This is my life, right? No. Um, but this is not the totality of me. Mm. And I would love to allow for this person to experience the totality of me. Mm. Yeah. I want to come on the other side now mm -hmm. because when we are now getting to the point of getting married, I think all of us have kind of an imaginative script of what it is. <laughs> what it is supposed to be or what we at least want it to be mm -hmm. and then there's the real real mm -hmm. and you know there's relativity to all of our experiences but i can say definitely and my wife would say the same that you know there is what you envision before the wedding day yeah, yeah. there's yeah. the wedding day and then there's everything afterwards yep. and yep. to be fair and to be proper um excuse me to be fair and to be comprehensive a lot of that does come to fruition and you're like wow and maybe, maybe even beyond, like this is even better than what I thought. Yeah, yeah. But then sometimes you encounter seasons and moments where it's just like, I don't think I signed up for this, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. Jasmine begins to have some health challenges, yes. right? And not common cold challenges. So she has attended to you. She has seen you for you. She's been there for you. Um, what is it like now really having to attend to her and be there for her and yeah. really say, mm -hmm. hey, baby, it's all about you. Yeah, I, I think it's twofold. Um, first, as you alluded to, right, it's um, getting your um, presuppositions mm. and your beliefs about yeah. marriage and relationships into alignment. I remember I was sure. washing dishes. This is month one. Uh, we're in our new apartment. <laughs> I'm washing dishes. I don't know if I told you a story before. Jasmine comes around the corner. I take some of the soapy water and I flick it at her. Because, you yeah. know, in movies, you know, you right, talk right. about water, then you guys are running around the house laughing and it's a tickle fight and then you go for a walk, right? That yeah. girl almost beat the brakes off me. <laughs> then, like, I remember it like it was yesterday. And I was so hurt. I was like, 
we're supposed to go running through the house. I, I threw water on you. And, and I remember her saying, this ain't the movies. Uh, <laughs> and, and I've had to, and I still, I still wrestle with this, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm emotional. Um, yeah. Just getting into alignment, my presuppositions about marriage and relationships. It's, we, we were lied to, right? By our parents, by oh. society, by the, uh, the movie industry, all of us were lied to. And yeah. we do the hard work of parsing through what reality is and then building mm. for ourselves an ecosystem that reflects who we actually are as a unit, right? The other thing I would say, uh, so Jasmine, um, I remember this like it was yesterday. Jasmine was lying on her hospital bed um, and she looked over at me and I could see, Jasmine thought she was going to die. Share with us, if you are willing to, what it is that she was um, Sure. I'll, 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 I'll give as much as I think she'll let me give without uh, asking her first off. So Jasmine had a, um, a serious brain condition mm -hmm. um, yeah. that required brain surgery. And at the end of the brain surgery, um, they pretty much, <laughs> before she woke up, pat me on the back and said, yep, no, we can do, and um, sent us home. Mm. Uh, crippling pain. She couldn't move. She couldn't open her eyes. She couldn't. It's nothing but the grace of God that she's here today, honestly. Yeah. Um, I remember her sitting on her hospital bed. She uh, was preparing to go in for her brain surgery. Yeah. And um, she, couldn't, she couldn't even see me. Um, she, her, her pain was so much, I don't know if she realized at the time, but she naturally curled herself up into this position and yeah. you, you could not move her from there. I had to carry her around the house. And um, she said, if I die, will you be angry at God? Mm. And I probably upset her. I said, no. And um, I don't know if she got it at the time, but I love to use this analogy. Um, I, can, I can bench press a pretty significant amount in the gym. Um, I'm only able to bench press that significant amount because I practice bench pressing insignificant amounts. Mm. Right. We underestimate the necessity of struggle in our lives. Mm. Right? We underestimate the necessity of tension. And what I find is that navigated struggle prepares you to navigate struggle. Right. Uh, old folk would say, um, if you did it before, you could do it again. For me, if I could walk you through the entirety of my story, we'd be here for days, but just the things that God has done along the way, the, the, the manner with which he has shown up and like, hey, I'm here, um, has caused me to dis disassociate God and the cause of suffering. Yeah. Right. In fact, our professor, um, Dr. James Doggett, says um, the chief agent of God's chosen revelation to the universe is suffering. Hmm. He revealed himself Earth. in his son in suffering. He, revealed, mm. he, he, he is revealed in suffering. And I, I have become intentional about looking for God, not just in the good times but in suffering yeah god where are you in this what are you saying in this and so the manner with which god has ministered to me in suffering the manner with which my wife has ministered to me in suffering i i, I lost my father uh uh four years ago and the manner with which my wife poured into me in that time has allowed me to disassociate the catalyst the cause of suffering and god or my relationships and suffering. So people would say, you often hear, uh, my wife said this, she said this on her hospital bed. She said, uh, she asked me once, she said, um, do you love me? And I said, yes, I do. And she said in her mind, she said to herself, he's gonna leave me. He's gonna leave, he's gonna leave me. And I asked her, you know, long after she's healed and so forth, and like, well, she's better. And uh, I said, why did you think that I would leave you? She said, because we're young. You didn't sign up for this. 
Mm. You, know, you didn't you, you didn't say I'm gonna get married to spoon feed somebody. Um, and for me, again, going back to my own struggles, I'm able to to see who Jasmine is mm -hmm. apart from what is currently covering her. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it, it's, it's my daughter who, I, I used to, you know, people who aren't parents, they see these pictures on Facebook, like with kids, when they, you know, poop their diapers and it comes up to their neck and they're like, throw the whole baby away, you know, as, you know, as a joke. And um, right. I remember being in there. And then I remembered the first time Jean had a blowout or the time, just the first time she was really sick. We were hearing a noise in her room. We went into her bedroom and she's lying in her crib and her entire crib is filled with vomit mm. and she's lying there with her face in it. Mm. And there was just an overwhelming sympathy. Like, it was like, oh baby, let me clean you. Like, let me, I didn't care about the vomit. I didn't care about the feces. I put my, I remember the first, there was one time she was throwing up, we were in her room, she was sick and she was throwing up and reflexively, I tossed my hands out to catch the vomit coming out of her mouth. So it wouldn't dry, it wasn't like all me. It was, this is my baby. Yeah. And I, I, want, I want to remove you from the filth that is covering you. With Jasmine, it's like, yo, you're my wife and yeah, you're sick and yeah, you're in pain and yeah, but, but I'm here because I want to remove you from this thing that's, that's, that's inflicting you. This, mm -hmm. this is not gonna separate me from you. If anything, it'll draw me closer to you because I wanna clean you. And I remember, yo, you remember Ezekiel, God says, I found you. You mm -hmm. were naked and bloody and broken and I picked you up and I cleaned you off. Like that, I find that in suffering, in relationship, in hard times, right? If you're looking at that thing correctly, it brings you to a point where you say, man, how can I walk alongside you to make you feel better? Mm. And, yeah, that, that's just been Jazz and I. And we've had rough times, we have uh, disagreements, we have arguments, we have, uh, but even, even in our arguments, right? Like when something happens and I, I upset her, she upsets me, whatever, I find myself, uh, you know, the, the door will be closed and she's on that side and I'm over here and I'm so mad at her. And like this tiniest part of me would be like, oh, but she's probably feeling sad. Yeah. Let, let me go and talk to her. You know what I'm saying? It's just that, <laughs> that, that understanding that this person I'm in a relationship with is suffering. Sure. What is my part in alleviating that from them? How can I, yeah. how can I get in touch with them that way? Mm -hmm. One of the things that was a game changer for me in marriage were, were two lines, two concepts that came from two separate books. Um, one of them was called, is called Redeeming Manhood. Mm -hmm. And the other book is called Sacred Marriage. Okay. Um, Redeeming Manhood gave me this notion of becoming a student of my spouse. Mm -hmm. That however much you think you know them, there's no plateauing, you know? And the moment you think there's a plateau, the moment you're gonna begin to experience some, some challenges. But becoming a student of your spouse. The other connecting component was in sacred marriage. And that author said that you have to get to know your unique spouse. Mm -hmm. In other words, the notion of spouse, it can be like, you know, general, you know, everybody has a spouse, but yeah. I only have this spouse and mm -hmm. she is unique. And so as I'm studying her, I'm learning who she is, yeah. the way we interact, the way we relate. Um, my understanding of her then in many ways informs how I interact with her. Mm -hmm. And it takes a great deal of humility and sacrifice to just say, as a husband, I'm a lifelong student mm -hmm. of, of Kyla, of Jasmine, you know? Yeah. And so that's what was coming to mind as you were sharing, like we, we just continue to get to know one another Bro. and we are willing to get to know one another through the seasons of life. Yeah. You know, all seasons, thankfully are not, you know, so intensely, acutely, painful mm -hmm. but it is it is it is it's the lighter weight like you said that helps me lift the heavier weight yeah and so yeah. i got i have to be just as intentional there as i am when it comes to the like whoa yeah and it helps redefine then when we say i didn't sign up for this well you 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 did you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. and um and and you learn what that really means as you go yeah and bro like it, it's it's so there's a I'm, I'm still learning, still growing, right? There's, I, I apply one of my exegetical practices to my marriage. I try to, mm -hmm. um, in, in that, 
what I tell people when they're like, yo, teach me how to study the Bible. I tell people context changes locatively, context mm-hmm. changes temporally, and context changes uh, relationally. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, Kai in England is different than Kai in Bermuda, yeah. is different than Kai in, in Virginia, right? right? And so I love that you said I'm continually learning in that who, who my spouse is today is not necessarily who she is tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and so I studied for the, for the, the Kyla exam yesterday and I may have passed it, um, but the, the technology has been updated, right? Yeah. Uh, and so if I rely on uh, what I crammed yesterday to get me through today, I'll find that my grades start to fall short um, sure. because there needs to be a consistent uh, and continual, like you said, study of who my spouse is. Sometimes Jasmine, Jasmine is, Jasmine is so irritating because when I met Jasmine, her favorite color was, um, it was like, it was like gold and this weird, like maroonish color. And so I buy everything in like gold. Blah, blah, blah. And then one day she was like, why are you getting me all this gold? And like, it's your favorite color. And she was like, no, it's green. And I was like, oh, okay. So I started getting her green stuff, a bunch of green stuff. And then she's like, oh, so much green. I'm like, that's your favorite color. And she goes, no, it's black and white. And so, is it, but yeah, I, I realized <laughs> getting upset with her, right? Not yeah. fair. You have not been doing the work of paying attention to your wife and seeing her shifting in pattern, right? Mm. It shouldn't be where she has to come to me and say, hey, I see you try and thank you so much. My favorite color is now this, but rather my noticing, I mean, it's in perfect world, right? But my noticing, hmm, Jasmine seems to be buying a lot more black and white today than she was a few years ago. Maybe I should start leaning in that direction. Right. So I love that you said that continual study. Yeah. Uh, I recently, at the time of this recording, recently uh, put up a new music alert. Hey. Um, you are a, in addition to being a pastor, a husband, um, a friend, a father, you are a songwriter, a mm. psalmist, a worshiper. Give us the inspiration behind The Lord is Great and um, Great Grace. And really, just in addition to those singles, First of all, just congratulations. Thank like, you. Let me just pause and, and say that, right? Um, that is no small feat. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not cheap. It's not, it, it takes courage. It takes investment. It takes mm-hmm. time. Um, mm-hmm. People think, oh no, BC, he sings and all he needs is to give him a mic and press record and then it's up on <laughs> all streaming platforms. You know, m- maybe that's your testimony, but I don't know. Um, so congratulations, man, on yet another investment in musical ministry. So what's the inspiration behind these songs, man? And what does music do for you in terms of providing, you know, just language for you to express yourself? Yeah, um, I, I think those questions are are uh, kissing cousins, if I can use that phrase, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in that I write out of my emotion. Okay. Um, I've never been one to sit down and say, I'm gonna write a song and then just like start writing. But when I say I'm gonna write a song, I sit down and one of the first questions I ask myself is, what am I feeling? Okay. And then I kind of start speaking to that feeling. If I'm writing, you know, gospel or Christian music, I start speaking to that from a Christian perspective. If I'm, if I'm writing uh, R&B or, uh, you know, whatever, I, I start talking about that feeling. Right. Sure. Not necessarily trying to find a solution, but let me express what I'm feeling. Um, and, and, and so that's that's where my writing kind of comes from. Um, I lean on what I'm feeling and try to either find answers for that biblically or yeah. just be able to express that uh, clearly. Um, the Lord is well, great grace. Um, I wrote. I'm sorry, I wrote that in 2018. Yeah, at least in 2019 or 2018. Um, Pastor Kimberly Bulgin actually reached out to me. Uh, she was then uh, pastoring at Grace Community Church in Cleveland. And right. she goes, AOB, we, um, we're putting together this, this worship project um, for the church. And we want to know if you'd be able to write a song for us. I was like, yeah, I got you. I'm sitting down like, well, the church is called Grace. Let's play with that, right? And so I began to ask myself the question, you know, what in this moment, right now at least, what does grace mean to me? What is grace? 
Mm-hmm. So I began to just unpack that thing, right? I, I know the grace, um, uh, speaking to God in this moment, that you poured on the world um, to save us from what we had become, right? The same grace that you used to ransom us from sin is the yeah. same grace that was applied to us when you looked at us and said, you're my son, you're my daughter, you're my child, right? It's the same grace. Um, yeah. And then I began to unpack that thing, man. It's sufficient. It covers all my needs. It's, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so in just expressing grace, yeah. you know, that, that, that came forward there, at least lyrically. Um, uh, the Lord is great. I wrote, Lord, some maybe 14 years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, I typically, when I start writing, if I don't have an immediate melody line in my head, I'm writing intentionally. I usually start on the bottom, either percussively or with the bass line. And um, so a lot of my songs come from my footfalls. Okay. And um, I, was wa- I was walking home. I was having a really good day. I just wanted to express it in a really easy way. I didn't want cumbersome, tons of lyrics. I just wanted, like, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to, like, shout something to somebody, and that person would shout something back to me. Yeah. It was like a follow response thing. I remember walking and I was like, almost like a skip thing. My feet fall, my footfalls were going. Tat, 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 tat. And I was like, the Lord is great and greatly to be prayed. And in my mind, there was someone across the street who was like, the Lord is great. Yeah. And um, it just became this like celebrative uh, call and response. And I said, like, well, let's, let's, let's describe why he's great, right? So king of kings and the earth is yours. Lord, you rule and reign forevermore. Yeah. So we lift our hands and uh, it, 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 it came from there. So um, I really lean on my emotions, whatever. even melodically, when mm-hmm. I'm crafting a melody, um, I'll play around with movements, uh, intervals, chord progressions, and I'll see what pricks my heart in that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll play something and say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'll, uh-huh. I'll sit with that for a little bit and I'll, I'll put words. So the one I'm, um, there's another one I'm, bring, I'm putting out in a couple of weeks called the Advent. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's like that. It's, it's, it's like that. I was sitting at, <laughs> uh, sitting in my kitchen. I was having a horrible day. I was washing dishes. And I just wanted it to be over. Not, not mm-hmm. like my life, but I wanted, I was like, all right, God, you know, we've got to that age where you're like, even so come Lord Jesus. Yeah, like, yeah. Our parents used to say, come now, Lord. Like I'm at that point where it's like, all right, God, let's make this thing happen. And I was just sitting there and I was like, Lord, send your power. We need your power. We mm-hmm. need it now, right now. And it just, kept pouring out of me yeah um and i sat down and said all right let's let's put let's put some chords to that let's play and i just i i leaned toward what my heart was speaking in that moment yeah and those lyrics and those you know melodies and harmonies are coming out of what i'm feeling in this moment and a little while ago i realized something fred hammond d d no not arguably the greatest (laughs) gospel artist of all time period um, right <laughs> period he put out an album uh and i remember this thing when he, in like the notes and even at the intro to the video um even back then they had these gospel dvds they put out for albums and i'm mm-hmm. um, dating myself and um at the start of that joint he said he had a dream mm. in that dream uh he was in heaven and god approached him and said hey fred come here so he walked with cool. him and then God was standing in front of a huge vault and opened the vault. And God said, these are my favorite songs. Wow. Sing them. And for me, I started realizing, man, mm. I'm going through stuff and God is answering or speaking to what I'm going through in the songs he's dropping in my heart. Mm. Um. Like, like something will happen, I'll feel bad. And one of the songs I wrote um, uh, for the Madison Mission Project was Even Now. And um, I remember sitting there and I was like, man, I just, I feel so alone. You know, mm-hmm. I actually wrote that right after that three months of hiding in my room I spoke to you about. And God was just like, yo, I'm, I'm there now. Like stop, pause for a little bit, even in your depression, even in your, just breathe. Mm. feel that I'm, I'm there now 
Uh, in fact, the second verse, I didn't put it on the on the song. I might at least on the second one. The second verse says, in my sorrow, in Woo. my grief, you're ever faithful, Lord, to me. Yes. So even now, Lord, even now, I feel your presence, even now. He's answering like my heart cries in song. Yeah. So I almost, yeah. I almost don't, don't even want to take credit for writing them. It's like he's speaking to me and I'm saying, okay, cool. Here's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm writing that down right now as we speak <laughs> on my iPad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, even now. Yeah, that's real. Mm -hmm. That's real. That's real. Um, I think it's so awesome that you're sharing context and... Um, allowing us to have a frame to kind of put the picture in mm -hmm. because it only serves to, in my estimation, make for a more connective experience. First of all, just hearing your voice, like Apple music, I'm like, it's BC. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Babe, I know him, man. we know him. And she's like, yeah, that's him. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, it, it's just kind of a, you know, you go from thinking that people who have their voices and their songs recorded are just people you'll never know. But yeah. you know, when it's someone you do know, and as you are inviting us to become a little bit more acquainted with you know, the life and times of BC and Wade, um, it, it only serves to make that, that proclamation that the Lord is great, mm -hmm. um, even more experiential and relational to say, man, this is not an the Lord is great that has no backing to it. It is me saying on a day where, you know, the day might not have been great. You know what I mean? I'm in the recording booth, you know, the mic's in front of me. I know the lyrics, you know what I'm mm -hmm, saying? Mm -hmm. Or the next day, the day before that. And um, I think it allows us to be able to say, well, what about my days? You know, am I just waiting for the perfect day to say the Lord is great? Mm -hmm. Or can my, the Lord is great, be a testament to who he is Yeah, as an ever-changing God throughout the ebb and flow of my life? Right. Yeah. And you're right. You know, as we do get older numerically and a little bit wiser based on our experiences, we do say, Lord, come, mm -hmm. you know, um, I was sharing with Kyla that I'm a traveler. I love to, you know, land in new places, yes, see new do. faces, taste new food, you know, say, man, this is real. Mm -hmm. I've seen it on television or in magazines. This is actually here. And I want to go everywhere. I, that's, that's how I say it in summary. And I just want to go everywhere. This world is huge. There's so much to learn. But the past year and a half uh, have had me really reevaluating, not so much travel as much as, so, you know, in terms of the health realities, but, but travel in terms of like priorities. You know, Lord, <laughs> come. Yeah. You know, there was a time being very, 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 very honest where theologically, you know, I ascend to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and I want that to happen. I get that that is the great corrective, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Anything else that we are doing and in many ways should be doing to make life as peaceable as possible and as, as livable as possible is good, you know, but, you know, the thing that's going to change is, is his return. I believe that. Mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. having said that, it's almost that relationship with the information, with the theology and my desires, like, but yeah. I want to get here and yeah. I want to travel there and I want to be able to do these things. And then after that list has been checked off, then, then you can come. Yeah. But now, bro, it's like, mm, you know, good. my lists, and this is just <laughs> travel lists, you know, yeah. but God, the list don't have to be completed. You know, I'm you good. can come. <laughs> Thank you for what has been. Thank you for what my eyes have seen. But, you know, it's okay. I'm it's good. Okay. I'm good. And, it, and it's so true, man. And I think those kinds of realities really do inform preaching, singing, and ultimately the lives that we live. Um, I'll never forget Dr. Gregory Allen's mm -hmm. class. BC, I don't know if it was Introduction to Christian Ministry or if it was New Testament, but he introduced the concept of worldview. Um, he was the first professor that I recall presenting that to us. And I can't tell you how much that since then it continues to, yep. you know, kind of circle in my mind about how, you know, your worldview changes and, and it matures and it grows. And I think, you know, I've been pushed to say, Lord, you know, the main thing has to be kept the main thing to use yeah. Dr. Quasi, right? Yeah, Dr. Quasi. <laughs> uh, you know, as much as we do 
do life, you know, help us to remember that it's unto God and, you know, unto this, this final destiny. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, man, the Lord is great. Yeah, man. And the greatly to be praised. Yeah. So just before we come to an end here, I want to give you an opportunity to, to talk about another special lady in your life. Um, and you've kind of mentioned her already, your daughter. Um, when we were last together in person, breaking bread, you said, man, Rich, what's crazy is before my very eyes, I'm seeing her become more aware of her independence. Yeah. And you said, bro, I can only put it to you in my own words. And when you become a father, Rich, you'll get it. But it's like crazy. And one of our yeah. other guys was there and he was like, no, Rich, it, it's really like something that is like all inside of you. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, please like, stop. Please stop. So, you know, what is this current season of life like for you in terms of fatherhood? <sighs> bro, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so funny you asked it today. Gene... She's not having a good day today. She lied to me today. Oh, mercy. She lied to me today. Ah. And, and the thing is, I, didn't, like, I, was, I was watching her do it, and I was like, maybe she doesn't understand what I'm saying. Maybe mm-hmm. it's not intentional. She can't be doing this. Yeah. Um, we bought her a new, uh, sc- her mother bought her a new school bag for school. Yeah. And she's, I, she's just so excited about the bag. I know she just wants to sleep with the bag and take the bag with her. So last night, Jasmine goes, please don't put anything in that bag at your school bag. Mm. This morning, I'm getting her ready. I see her walking around with the bag. And I say, honey, your mother said don't put anything in the bag. Is there anything in the bag? She stops and she goes, no. And I said, are you sure nothing's in the bag? And she said, there's nothing in the bag. I mean, outright, there's nothing (laughs) in the bag. So I said, all right. And I, I stopped. I said, hey. Baby, I'm gonna give you some time to take mm-hmm. whatever's in the bag out of the bag. And she goes, nothing in the bag. It's all right. So get her ready. I go and I grab the bag and I open it and it's full of toys, full of toys. And I know she doesn't mean anything by it. She's just excited about the bag. She loves bags anyway. She wants to carry her things around. It's like a grown person. And I said, baby, um, you lied to daddy this morning. There are things in the bag out right there. And she goes, yes. And I said, so we're not taking the bag to school today. Um, mm. You know, we could try again tomorrow. We're not taking it today. I started pulling it and this girl started, I mean, like, and I said, it's all right. You know, and I'm watching her now. Her whole day is off. She's sad. She's, and seeing a person grow Mm-hmm. Right, she's in a phase now where she's testing boundaries. Like, don't touch that. Don't do that. Don't go there. Leave that alone. Hey, that's not safe. That's dangerous. And despite the warnings, despite the call to not do it, she's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to make this thing happen. Mm-hmm. And seeing her do that and learning how much leeway to give, right? Um, how, how, how to develop her into a functional person with um um onus with uh desire to do their own thing but still with the wisdom and the discernment to know when i should hear what's being said to me yeah Um, it's tough man and there's no book you learn on the fly um i read somewhere that uh, a child's personality their uh, characteristics their the way they deal with life and relationships is developed by what they are submerged in um at the age of five now jazz and i this morning she was like hey we got two more years Hmm. Um, let's be intentional when we talk to her let's let's try not to raise our voices you know hey let's um let because because this new phase where she's just like i'm gonna do what i want to do He's like, let, 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 let that little girl. Uh. Right. And um, Jasmine's like, hey, we got to be intentional about not coming off so strong, right? Okay. I was still firm. Uh, so she hated me this morning because she started fake, she has a fake cry. And I said, hey, baby, please stop fake crying. And the reason why I asked them to do that is because um, I know you're a real cry from your fake cry, but others don't. And if they get into the habit or the mindset that, oh, she's just pretending, when something's really happening, they won't come to your aid. So I'm telling her that, telling her that. And she's like, I'm going to fake cry. I don't care what you say. 
So I said, all right, cool. You know, we have the thing now where um, probably because I was in the military, I'm so sorry for her. She does, um, she does wall sits and planks uh, <laughs> punishment. <What>? So <laughs> she was, she was, she was all one this morning. I said, all right, go squat. I go do a wall sit. She's like, no, 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 no. She was doing it for a while. She's daddy, I'm tired. I said, you're tired. She's yes. I want to listen now. I said, no, you don't want to listen now. You want to stop. Since you're tired, get into a plank. She gets to mm. a plank. I mean, she's weeping. And so uh, I get her up and um, I said, why do we do this? And she said, because I was not listening. And I said, and so it's, it's tough because we do that. I go into another room and I want to tear my clothes off and, you know, I, I want to give her everything and I want to, um, but it's allowing me to see the way God deals with me. He deals with us Mm -hmm. and the way I want God to deal with me isn't often the way that I deal with my daughter. Mm. Uh, I want more grace than I'm ready to give. Mm. It's been kind of retooling me, um, and help me to kind of deal with this, this three major that we have in the house. Uh, but yeah. she's great, man. She's doing great. She's about to test for kindergarten. Uh, wow. Yeah, she's, she's killer, man. She's a really, really dope girl. So. Yeah, mm. that's so beautiful, man. Um, and it's beautiful in all of its imperfection. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, it's just, there's really no script. Um, yeah, like you said, it's on the job training. You I'm trying to figure out how to say what I want to say. <laughs> I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a card out of your wallet and swipe it. <laughs> I hated you for this because you raised the bar so high for all future fathers. You sang at your daughter's birth. <laughs> yes. 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 And um, by hated you, I mean, I loved you so much for it because it was authentically you. Mm-hmm. And it was such a moment. I mean, it's just a miracle, miraculous moment as is, but mm-hmm. to, but to capture that moment yeah. as her father yeah, in a way that she will come to know you even more, you know, daddy's always singing. And, and I'm sure that she is catching that language for herself. She's writing you know songs. I mean? She's yeah. Like she'll sit in the, yeah. be, daddy, I wrote a song. You wrote a song. She's writing whole songs. It's funny because jazz, jazz is a, you know, jazz is an amazing singer. Yeah. And we would, we would sing to her in the womb. Yep. Um, and uh, when she was born, she came out crying. And Jasmine was just like, hey, B, sing to her. Mm-hmm. So we sang the same song. It's a bedtime song we sang every night. And we're singing it. And this kid stops crying and starts, like, just chilling. Just listen to the song. And um, since then, we're like, oh, this is something. You know, we, it was, oh, she, she's talented, whatever. But I noticed, like, she was, like, one and a half. And... I'd be running scales da, 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 and I would stop for some reason and she would go da, 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 da. and I mean finishing them she she is just such a talented individual yeah. and one of the more daunting things for me is you know I have I have this um amazing piece of equipment mm. and I'm terrified that I'm gonna drop it mm. right that I'm gonna like she she's a genius she is multi-talented multi-faceted and for me it's like okay god show me how to best nurture what you've placed in her help me not kill anything right um it's 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 tough but but getting those moments where it's like oh yeah we this this i i'm just gonna do me right i'm gonna sing to this girl and then watching her sing back to us um now she's in the car she doesn't know songs names just say daddy play and she'll start singing the song that's like that's exactly how the song goes yeah. uh we'll play it for her she's she's phenomenal and so i'm just yeah. i'm grateful i don't feel bad though uh because those who don't know uh m comes before n and so in every <laughs> class we've ever had i had the miraculous richard martin directly that's all we have for this me. episode of the living room <laughs> <laughs> So any, any, any paper I turned in, any project I had to do had to be better than everybody else's because Richard was coming right before mine and I, I, I could not uh, uh, lay an egg behind him. So don't, don't listen to this guy, man. <laughs> don't listen to this guy. Man, we want to leave the, um, the last word with you. And I want to ask it this way. If you could send yourself a text message 10 years into the future, what does it say? 
I thought hard about this. It's tough. I settled on thank you. Um, because if I'm able to send myself a text message 10 years in the future, it means that I did not give up on myself. Mm -hmm. I'm still here. I had a, a vision in the middle of a praise and worship session at uh, New Life Fellowship at Andrews University, maybe four years, three years ago, three years ago. And um, I was singing, we were talking about the blessing that God um, is working and will work in our lives. And I saw, I saw a house, I walked up to the house, I looked in the window and I saw, um, kids running through the window. I heard happy voices. It was like Christmas time. I couldn't see any face, but I just saw people moving in the house. It, just, it seemed so warm and delightful in there. And then I saw myself come around the corner. I was wearing a, a roll neck cardigan, like reindeers on it. I was a little gray in the beard. And myself saw me looking into the window mm -hmm. and nodded knowingly and encouragingly and then turned around and went back to the family and then I came back and I was just so I was so happy hmm. that man I didn't give up on my family I didn't give up on my life I didn't you know I didn't run from responsibility hmm. here I am in this seemingly warm space i've clearly gone through challenges i've dealt with things but i'm here with what's most important to me and so being able to text myself 10 years in the future would be thank you mm. thanks for sticking it through yeah mm -hmm. mm. that's real mm. man share with us uh, how people can connect with you to continue conversations, um, support you in ministry and, and invest in your music. If uh, I wanted to anger my wife, I dropped my phone number right here, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> but you can catch me on, um, on I'm, I'm using on IG a lot, on Instagram uh, under Undibizzle, that's N-D-U-B-I-Z-I-L. Um, uh, I live on I live on IG. On Facebook, using my full name, uh, Undibisi Wade. Um, send me a, send me a request. If I know you, I'll accept it. If I don't, I might not. Um, uh, I am developing a website, um, for folk to keep up with me, you know, um, who I am personally, um, my music, I have some books that are coming out, um, that you guys can catch Jefferson's vote, the devotionals I've written, it'll be on there as well. Um, uh, but those are how you can, you can, you can get, shoot me a DM, let me know what's, what's going on and, and uh, we can link up there. For sure, for sure, man. Appreciate you hanging out with us in the living room, carving out some time just to open up and share. Uh, we are better because of it, man. And thank you for your friendship, for your brotherhood. Um, that is becoming more and more important to me as I grow and as I go professionally and personally. And so I'm grateful that we've got history. Yeah. And I hope that that history continues to, to go on and go on and on and on. Um, so thank you so much, man. I do appreciate this. Man, thanks for having me. Uh, Greek Kai for me tell us it was good. And sure. uh, I appreciate you very much. Most definitely. Well, my friends, I know without a shadow of a doubt that as you have leaned in to listen, you have learned a lot that will be beneficial for your life. BC and Wade has shared with us that courage does not come down a straight path, but sometimes it has circuits to it. You're a little to the left, you're a little to the right. Sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down, but through it all, there's something on the other side of through that you wouldn't trade for the world. So what is courage? Yeah, sometimes there's some fear and sometimes there's some faith, but there's something else too. There are family members, there are friends. And I hope and pray that as you have listened to this conversation, you can walk away truly inspired and changed, encouraged to lead life a little bit more courageously as the you that you are and as the you that you are becoming. That's all we have for this episode of The Living Room. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Our special guest has been BC and Wade. Until next time, continue to listen, continue to learn, and continue to live.